Okay, so welcome back to part three of our study of the end times. Um, because there's been a five-week gap, I have to do a brief, very brief recap of where we are, okay? Because everyone, you will forget, don't we? So last time we looked at the first three and a half years of, the, uh, of Daniel's 70th week, or the, give it its more common name, the tribulation period. We saw how this seven-year tribulation will begin with a covenant or treaty made between the man of sin, the Antichrist, and Israel, the Jews, which will guarantee their peace and enable the Jews to restart their Old Testament sacrificial system, which is a great desire of the nation of Israel. We saw how the Antichrist will pose as the Messiah of Israel, a false Christ, who will ultimately de betray the Jews and then deceive the whole world. From Revelation chapter 6, we read how Jesus will open the seven seals. And we saw in order from Matthew 24, each one progressively being opened, and the consequences of each one. We then saw how the, the church of the tribulation period will suffer greatly under the persecution of the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 7. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. The servants are not greater than their Lord, are they? If they hated him, there will come a day they will hate us. Amen. We noted that another man will rise to power, a worldwide religious leader, the false prophet, another satanically inspired man who will point to and cause the whole world to worship the beast or the Antichrist, thus completing a trinity of evil. Satan, as the counterfeit of God the Father. The Antichrist, the counterfeit of God the Son. The false prophet, the counterfeit of God the Holy Spirit. Lastly, we saw an event that marks the, the halfway point of the tribulation, called the abomination of desolation. An event prophesied by Daniel in the Old Testament, by Jesus in the Gospels, and by Paul in the Epistles. So to resume from, from this point, the abomination of desolation. Does anyone remember what it is? Or what it was, sorry, what it will be? Yep. Yeah. Speak up, her. Yeah, what, what does he do there? No, that, that's what happened. Yeah, that's what happened with that, that uh, Greek leader, Anti uh, Syrian, Antiochus. That's what he did in, in between the Testaments, about 300 BC. I think it was something like that. No, the, the man of sin commits this. He goes into the temple in Jerusalem stops the Jewish sacrifices, proclaims himself as God. What a thing, isn't it? Proclaims himself as God. He sets up an image of himself which must be worshipped. Paul states in 2 Thessalonians at this, he says, he, as he's the Antichrist, will exalt himself so proudly and insolently above every so-called God or object of worship. He will not tolerate any worship but for himself. So that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. Notice the phrase, takes his seat 
in the temple of God. This is an act so blasphemous, it defies Jesus Christ himself. Where is Jesus now? He sat at the right hand of God. You see the See what this man's trying to do. Jesus called this act the appalling sacrifice that astonishes and makes desolate. Why the damning description? Why such strong language? Any ideas? It, I'll give you a clue. It mirrors an event in heaven in eternity past. Remember, he proclaims himself as God. What did Satan do? He did, didn't he? Isaiah 14, 12, verse 1. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So it's an event that happened in eternity past in heaven that will be replicated on earth as, this, as the Antichrist takes his seat as God in the temple of God. So this evening, I want to look at three mysteries. Anyone look like a good mystery? Three mysteries that will be fulfilled in the end times. Anybody, what does a biblical word, what, what does the word mystery mean? It occurs only in the New Testament, and it's, 20, it's there 22 times. What does it mean? Okay, anybody? <laughs> it means this. It means a thing hidden or a truth hidden by God, okay, that he in his providence and wisdom will reveal to his people in his time. So we see it, it, it's in that phrase, isn't it? The New Testament is hidden in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. So to give you an example of some mysteries, I'll give you two. We've got the mystery of the kingdom that Jesus spoke about. Jesus revealed the mysteries in how? In the parables. In Romans, we have the mystery of the gospel. And as Paul expounds it through the book. Ephesians, we have the mystery of the church, the calling of both Jews and Gentiles into one body. So, our first mystery tonight is found in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness, rebellion against divine authority, that is, and the coming reign of lawlessness is already at work. It was at work in Paul's day, it's still at work today, and it's coming to a head. Only until he who now restrains it is taken out of the way, then the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, will be revealed. So the mystery of lawlessness will have its final fulfillment and full revelation as the man of sin sits in the temple proclaiming himself as God. That is the pinnacle of lawlessness when it is fully revealed. Now, this act will signal the final three and a half years of the tribulation. And this will begin a reign of a time of utter terror for the Jews. What the Bible describes as the time of Jacob's trouble. The Jews, many of whom would have believed that the man of sin was their promised Messiah, will suddenly realize they have been betrayed 
and the persecution will begin greater than any in history, greater than what Hitler did to them. And, I mean, what we saw on October the 7th is a tiny, tiny thing of what it will be like, but it would be along those, along those lines. There would be no mercy. It would be, it'd be horrific. Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 24, 15 to 21. He said this. He said, he said therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see Antichrist in the temple sitting as God, spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea, the Jews, flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Multitudes of Jews, probably in the millions, will be slaughtered. But verse 23 tells us, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. God will preserve a remnant of Jews for himself. Revelation chapter 7 describes an angel who will seal the servants of God on their foreheads. Verse 4, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. These are not Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way, because they claim it's them, don't they? They're the children of Israel. It couldn't be plainer. 12,000 from each tribe. It's not Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, Revelation 12, verse 7 describes a war in heaven at this time between the archangel Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels, or falling angels. Satan is defeated and cast down to the earth. Verse 11 describes him as having great wrath because he knows his time is short. And his wrath is aimed at both the Jews and the church. Verse 11 of chapter 12 speaks of a people who will overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto death. Who were they? The church, facing martyrdom at that time. For the Jews, verse 13, the dragon in the person of the Antichrist will pursue them, the 144,000. But verse 14, the woman Israel was given the wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time in times and half a time. A time is one year, times is two years, half a time is six months, which makes a total three and a half years. God will preserve his remnant safe in, the, safe in a place in the wilderness out of the way. Now, last time from Revelation 13, we looked at the false prophet, a man who will call down fire from heaven, a man who will appear gentle as a lamb, yet speak as a dragon. He will exercise all the authority of the Antichrist and cause people everywhere to worship the man of sin. He will deceive the world by great signs and wonders and telling those that dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast and he will give power to the image of the beast to speak. Now, what form that will take and how that will happen, I don't know. I don't, don't really want to know, to be honest. Um, but those, anyone who would not worship the image of the beast will be killed. It's that stark. So would you please turn to Revelation chapter 13, please?
So verse 13 of chapter, verse 16, sorry, of chapter of Revelation 13, a very, quite a famous portion of scripture. Everyone seems to know this one, don't they? Even the lost do. So this false prophet, this third person of, the, of this satanic trinity, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. What is the number of his name? 666, isn't it? Verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, why? What, why? 666. What's the significance of that number? If you, if you know your Bible numbers. What's the number of perfection? Seven. Six is the number of man, isn't it? Fall short. Constantly falling short of God. Now, it's the number of his name. Now, I'm not sure if, if in some way those numbers have some sort of something to do with the name of this man, this Antichrist. I don't know. I mean, over the years, you've, there's been many attempts to, to, to you know, use strange math or arithmetic <laughs> to make certain characters' names add up to 666. I think they, 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 they tried, I think, I'm sure they tried it with Barack Obama at one stage. I'm sure they did. But it's not that. It's, it's nothing, it's, it, it is not that. It's, uh, it's, it's something I believe will only be revealed at the time when the man is manifested. But whatever it is, it falls short. It's the number of a man. It must fall short of God. So to buy or sell, you must have the mark of the beast. The, work, the word mark comes from the Greek word karagma. Now that word means an etching or a stamp, a mark of ownership. So we're starting to see now what this mark is all about. No mark on your hand or forehead. You will, basically, you'll starve. You won't survive. But for those who take this mark, the warning from Revelation 14, 9 and 10 is very plain. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. To receive the mark is to give yourself over to ownership, over to worship of the man of sin. It is to partake of his kingdom of evil and rebellion. A stark choice to be made at that time, I think. So in the person of the false prophet, we see the fulfillment of our second mystery of this study. Now, please turn to Revelation 17, verses 3 to 5. To five. Now, the apostle John writes, And the angel carried me away in the spirit into, the, into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and, and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. So, who or what is Mystery Babylon? So anyone want to have a go at that one? Mystery Babylon. Remember, this is something that was hidden by God, which is now being revealed to the Apostle John. So, 
Firstly, this is not referring to the city of Babylon. Okay? This is a mystery, something that is behind the scenes, if you like. What this means, it's a, it refers to a religious system, both blasphemous and idolatrous, that stretches back thousands of years. A system that, verse 1 says, sits on many waters. In other words, it is worldwide. Okay? Verse 2, it's a system of religion that seduces both kings, governments, and peoples with her idolatries. In verse 4, it's a system of incredible wealth adorned with gold and precious stones, yet full of abominations and spiritual filthiness. Now, the origins of mystery Babylon, we must go back to the book of Genesis, to Nimrod, the founder of Babel. Nimrod, the hunter of men's souls, he built a tower, didn't he? In defiance of God, a tower to reach into heaven, a false way to God. For this act, God sent confusion of languages among them and scattered them across the earth. As they scattered, they took their mystery religion with them. From Babel came the false idolatrous worship of the queen of heaven. The wife of Nimrod, according to ancient legend, this is not from the Bible, this is from, from ancient legend. The wife of Nimrod, Semiramis, and their son Tammuz, they were deified and they were adored as the queen of heaven and the son of God. The mystery religion spread. It came into Assyria. Ishtar became the queen of heaven there with Bacchus as her son. In ancient Egypt, it was in the form of Isis and Osiris. In India, Isai and Iswara were the virgins. In Greece, it was Aphrodite and their baby Eros. In ancient Rome, it was Venus, the queen of heaven, with Cupid as her son. Even in Ephesus, from the book of Acts, who do we see there? Diana, the famous temple. So we come forward to AD 313, the Roman Emperor Constantine. And did he really become a Christian? Or, or was it political expediency? We don't know, do we? We really don't know. Anyway, so he adopts Christianity, which soon becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, do they throw out the ways of Babylon? And do they adopt the true biblical faith of Christ? No. What they do is this. They mix Christianity with Babylonian paganism. The mysteries of, of, the, the mysteries of Babylon when they continue. A form of pagan Christianity develops. From Babylon, they adopt priestcraft. Prayer beads make an appearance. We know them as a rosary, don't we? Also common in other religions, Buddhism has this. They have prayer beads. Islam have prayer beads. You see the root source of it. Confessionals, again, straight out of Babylon. Prayers to the dead. Statue worship. Again, a feature of other great world religions, all originated from Babel. The worship of the Queen of Heaven begins with the elevation of Mary to this role. And it evolves into her becoming, to the present day, they call her co-redemptrix, co-redeemer with Christ. They say she's a perpetual virgin, who was assumed or ascended bodily into heaven, 
where she intercedes for the prayers of the saints, all straight from Mystery Babylon. Now, Catholic Rome in the early centuries after Christ begins to exert her, her, her power over kings and peoples and governments. Political power becomes her prime role. The popes begin to give themselves the title Pontifex Maximus. Who had that title before? The Caesars of the Roman Empire. They begin to claim to speak ex cathedra or to speak with divine authority. When the Pope speaks like this, if you don't believe him, it's a damnable heresy in their eyes. Verse 6 describes mystery Babylon as being drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now, in our many forms, mystery Babylon has persecuted God's people through the Old Testament times right through to the present day. Pagan Rome under the Caesars, Nero, Caligula. We all know what went on in the, in the Colosseum, don't we? With believers being thrown to lions, etc. Catholic Rome under the popes in the, with the Inquisitions. Thousands killed, Jews and Christians. Other religions around the world. Islam, a bitter enemy of Christianity. Hinduism in India. If you're a Christian in India now, keep a low profile. The Hindus don't like it. Amen. All, all based in, in mystery Babylon which is drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus. Now, in the last days, mystery Babylon will reach the very peak of her power. Verse 3 shows her sitting on a scarlet beast for the names of blasphemy. The false prophet will draw all the strands of mystery Babylon into one great world religion, a religion that will worship the beast a religion that will prostitute herself and use the Antichrist or attempt to, to use him for her own ends. So what will become? What's the fate of mystery Babylon? God will judge her and utterly destroy her. Verses 16, 17. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. They will make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For this, listen to this, verse 17, for God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose. So the midpoint of the tribulation, the world will be experiencing the, its most darkest and desperate times in the whole history of this planet. And things are going to get even worse. Because the end time judgments of God are on the horizon. At this time, God will send a, vo a final warning to mankind. Revelation 11, verse 3. If you would turn there, please. Eleven, verse three, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days, or three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. Now, two men are suddenly going to appear in Jerusalem at this time. John describes them in verse four as two olive trees and two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Now notice what they're wearing. They're clothed in sackcloth. What is sackcloth significant of? Repentance. This will be their message. The final, the final call to the, rep to the world to repent or perish. Now, these two men will have miraculous power from God. Verse 6 tells us they have power to shut heaven so no rain falls. They can turn water into blood and strike the earth with plagues. The men will rage against them 
but no one can harm them in any way. Verse 5, if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours them. Verse 7, only when their ministry is complete will they be killed. The beast which ascends from the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Verse 8, their bodies will be left to rot on the streets of Jerusalem. So hated will these two men be that verse 10 says, people will rejoice over their deaths and give each other gifts in celebration. It's like Christmas, inverted. Verse 11, after three and a half days, the breath of God entered and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Verse 12, a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud. Now, who are these two men? Anyone want to hazard an answer or guess? Who are these two men? Have they, have they been on the earth before? Come on, car, you name one. Yeah, Elijah is a strong possibility. He never died, did he? He was taken to heaven and chariot. Amen. Most commentators would agree that. The first one is Elijah. Now, like these men, Elijah, in his ministry on earth, in the Old Testament, what did he do? He called fire down from heaven. And what else did he do? Stopped the rain, didn't he? Three and a half years. Now, the other man, possibly, you can't say for certainty, could be Moses. Why? The plagues. These men are able to send plagues. The plagues in Egypt. The turning the river, the water into blood. Another one that they'll do. Both replicated in Revelation 11. Both Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Stood either side of him. Moses representing the law. Elijah, the prophets. There is another candidate, Enoch, because Enoch never died. But <laughs> he, never, he never died. Pers personally, I, I would probably say Mo Moses is prob definitely Elijah, pro probably Moses, possibly Moses, or the most likely two. But we're open to be proved wrong, aren't we? Amen. So if you remember, if you go back to the very first session, we, we looked at the timing of the rapture, the catching up by Jesus of all believers to meet him in the air. Now, we have to ask the question, does Jesus rapture his church before the tribulation starts? Or does he rapture them at the end of the tribulation? A contentious issue. A contentious issue for many believers, isn't it? You want to start a row? Pick a side. <laughs> but it's a topic that um, we all should have an element of liberty on. It's, nothing, it's not heretical to take either view. Okay? But tonight I want to give you an alternative to those two views. This is a view that is starting to, to gain traction in the church from many commentators. It says that Jesus will rapture his church shortly after the midpoint of the tribulation, but before the end of the seven years. Thus, before the day of the Lord or the wrath of God begins. Now, why hold to this view? Firstly, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath. He has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, we are not under any form of God's wrath. Why? The cross. Jesus paid it all. He took all the wrath of God that we deserved 
on the cross on himself. We're, we're free from it. We have peace with God. Now, to give you two examples of God's people being delivered before his wrath falls, okay? Matthew 24, 37, 39. But as in the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, can you see how Noah was delivered from God's wrath? As soon as the day he was delivered, the flood came. Our second example is from Luke 17, 28, 29. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they played, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, on the very day, what happened? It rained fire and brimstone, from heaven and destroyed them all. Again, an example of God removing his people first and then his judgment falls on the wicked. Now, 30 times in both testaments, the Bible warns of the coming of the day of the Lord, a time when the wrath of God will be poured out on this world, a time when the long-suffering of God with the wicked will end. When mercy will end, there will be no forgiveness, no salvation. But the church of Jesus Christ will be raptured just before that begins. So our third and final mystery this evening is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. And I shall read it from the Amplified version, because it, it makes great reading. Fifth, verse 51, listen very carefully, okay? I will tell you a mystery, a secret truth decreed by God and previously hidden, but now revealed, in brackets. We will not all sleep in death, but we will all be completely changed, wondrously transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trumpet call for a trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and will be completely transformed what an amazing event that will be in an instant in the twinkling of an eye the smallest possible amount of time our bodies changed to a body like his glorious body. That's the rapture of the saints. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That word caught up is, is harpazo, I think it is in Greek, and it means forcibly caught up. You would have no say in it. Jesus will, will go, just like that. Wonderful. Now, how can we describe this, this experience? Can't. There's not enough word you can't. You, you can read about it, you can talk about it, but it, it's too glorious an event to describe. What we can know about this event, it will be joy unspeakable. The saints of God from all ages, all the old great Old Testament characters, the New Testament characters, the, the saints who lived 1500... 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, 100 years ago, our, our, our relatives who have passed on, 
And all, all of us that remain and are alive, all caught up together in a, in a great a multitude, a, a company of people that no man could number. And we'll all gaze, I believe, I believe we'll all gaze in utter wonder and praise at Jesus Christ in all his beauty and holiness and glory. Amen? What a, well. <laughs> and he will look at us his bride, his beautiful bride, beautified by himself, perfected, and he will look and he will see the travail of his soul. Amen? And he will be satisfied. And at that high point, we'll end tonight, because next time we're going we're gonna to finish off the tribulation, we're going to look at the judgment seat of Christ for believers, we're going to set foot into the millennium, the final judgment, and then a biblical look into what eternity holds. Amen? And hopefully we'll be complete next time. Thank you.